his um, educational grades. But I don't think someone of that that caliber should should be allowed to be Labour leader. He's he's a he's a good man. I'm not. This is not an anti Corbyn speech. I mean, but again, it's about humility of heart. He should realise he's not up to scratch. In fact, he is. He's now saying, you know, I'm tired. I want to step down. Well, he should step down now to allow... In fact, what should happen, in my opinion, is Keir Starmer and him should swap places. Keir Starmer is a better leader. He understands why Brexit has to be opposed. Hook, line and sinker. And, and Corbyn would make a great deputy leader. I don't know that even we need for a vote. They could just have a private arrangement. Keir and, and Jeremy could swap roles. And Keir Starmer is a better speaker in the Commons. Corbyn has two modes, it seems to me. He has complete silence, which is what he did during the anti-Semitism debate, or he has shouting hysterically at Theresa May, you know. <laughs> you need someone of gravitas who speaks normally, and that's, Keir Starmer has that gift, I think. Um, anyway, <clears throat> politics is a mess, and what I think should happen... Um, I think the right wing are going to try and do a coup and they're going to try and unseat Theresa May and put a right winger in who they hope they can then force Brexit down like a sort of, you know, like a fascist coup that will be actually. Um, and the Daily Telegraph are, are going to ratchet all the propaganda for that. That's shocking and disgraceful and I believe Parliament is not stupid. They will vote that down. <clears throat> Theresa May for all her sins, has at least tried to find a middle way. She did try and find some sort of compromise. Um, she's not an extremist of that, that bad variety. Um, but what I think should happen is that a moderate government of national unity should come together. The crisis is so bad that we should see a new government and a new prime minister emerge from the Commons. The Tory party, in my opinion, because of Brexit, should not be left to push this thing. Um, <clears throat> and I think the moderate Conservatives, perhaps Theresa May might rebrand herself as that. I mean, I've said that Theresa May should, should sack the hardline Brexiteers from her cabinet and put in moderates and then legislate for a second referendum and get the extension needed from Europe. If she came out finally as a moderate conservative, which is, I think, her instincts are to be that, um, she would receive the accolade of, of the UK. Um, if she wanted to be very generous, she could allow a few other figures from other parties into a cabinet of national unity. I don't see why Theresa May can't remain prime minister of a cabinet of a government of national unity, but only if she drops this my deal or no deal kind of nonsense. <clears throat> she has to then realise the only solution is to have a, um, a second referendum. And that should be legislated for fairly. I think there should be um, you know, a threshold put in so that if you're going to change the status quo and leave the, UK, uh, the EU, a certain percentage should, should win. That threshold should have been in there the first time. Uh, it's a dreadful lacuna that Cameron and his cronies didn't put it in. I mean, I, I think that's just shocking, the lack of intelligence of Cameron when he called that referendum. I think Cameron was way out of his depth. He wasn't, I mean, he was a nice guy, but he was just a PR salesman. And he tried to sell the party of the Tories as rebranded, you know, nice party. Um, but it was a fake thing, and the... the, the the transformation wasn't very deep. But we'll see. If, if the Conservatives can come round and support a, a, a move towards a government of national unity and, and a repeal of this Brexit, a suspension of it for a year or six months, and a second referendum, or an outright, or outright revocation. I mean, the other way is this p petition of five million people um, just want to revoke Article 50. Well, I would support that as well. Um, so <clears throat> my final point about politics is we're never going to get politics cleaned up till par parliamentarians have to tell the truth. The whole point of being a philosopher is to find out the truth.
The point of being a theologian is to <clears throat> is to reflect on the ultimate truths of the different religions and theologies and find the common ground. If politicians are some of the wealthiest, most powerful people on the planet, and yet they're lying all the time, the planet isn't looking good. <clears throat> the future's not very happy. So that's why I've said with my colleagues in the World Intellectual Forum that we have to bring these politicians to account. They have to, by law, tell the truth in Parliament and in the House of Congress and wherever else. All the problems we're seeing in politics are because the people have lost trust in politicians. We know they lie. That's why I'm writing a book about 9-11. We know that the Bush narrative was fake. We don't know what actually happened. That's why I'm investigating as a historian. I'm determined to set up an International Historical Commission of Inquiry into 9-11. I will do that. And the first of the two volumes has been published. The second one's coming out um, shortly. So, <clears throat> by restoring truth into the Commons and Parliament, <clears throat> we can gradually stop not just Brexit, but all the other stupid ideas that are floating, like you know Trump's wall with Mexico, and, uh, <clears throat> you know continuing to deny the rights of Palestinians by Israel or continuing to advocate terrorism against Israel by some fanatic Islamic terrorist groups, you know. The whole climate of politics should be refined to a discourse about truth. In Algeria, I strongly hope my Algerian friends find a solution to a new president peacefully. And um, <clears throat> in Syria, I hope that, again, tempers flare down, peace is established, the fanatics are not given the oxygen, the ISIS types, and that a, a moderate kind of um, <clears throat> true democratic Islam can, can, can take shape, which is what the Syrians want, along with their Christian and other religious followers. Syria is a very sophisticated culture. Um, the same in Jordan, where there's an amazing ancient Islamic, sophisticated uh, spiritual tradition that the king embodies. These cultures love peace. They want peace. We in Europe, in Britain, should be helping with that. It's a common project. We can only do that from a common humility. Brexit was an arrogant uh, fantasy cooked up by, by extreme um, egotists, Johnson and Farage and Co. And, and the British people yesterday in their march demonstrated that really enough is enough. We've had enough of that. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to finish, as I said, with a quote from the psalm, 46, which I <clears throat> uh, was sharing in prayer the other day. I'm only sharing a bit of it, but it's amazing. I'm doing a commentary on these psalms. Come and gaze at God's works. The one who has astounded the world with wonder, who has brought all the earth's wars to a halt. The bow will be shattered and the arrow split in half, the chariot burnt in fire. Be calm and know that I am your sustainer. I will be lifted in praise among nations. I will be lifted in praise throughout the earth. Now that short passage from Psalm 46 I think is one of the most amazing in the, in the whole Psalms. <clears throat> this is a beautiful new translation by an American Jewish uh, poet called um, Pamela Greenberg, <clears throat> which I strongly recommend to people. It's only very recently come out. And it's a marvellous poetic rendering of the Psalms. I mean, they're wonderful in the King James Version, but I think these are good for modern English speakers. And... The, the thing about that passage is God is a God of peace. You know, there are parts of the Bible where you read it and you think, what, is this God crazy? He's always going to war. Ultimately, God is a God of peace. And Solomon means, you know, the guarantor, the king of peace. Jerusalem is the place of peace. Judaism is a religion of peace. Moses, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. For everything else, it's, it's a religion of peace. And anything that says otherwise is not true Judaism. 
And this is the, the, the proof text, if you want. Um, why should we live in peace? Because we should gaze in wonder at God's works. As I was saying in my book on the egg, you know, I just look at the cells of an egg and I'm in wonder. Um, and I want to look in wonder at the one who is bringing all Earth's wars to a halt. I will look in wonder at, at, at the action of God who creates peace as a possibility. I see it like a rainbow, my image. I'm writing a book about peace magic at the moment. And one of the things I'm saying is when you're in conflict with somebody or you know people that are, you should project onto them visually a, a, a rainbow so that party A in dispute and party B in dispute, you know, a rainbow links them and therefore their angry energy can be transmuted into one of mutual, you know, respect and reverence for the creator who's at the apex of the rainbow. Um, God is constantly seeking peace, I believe. And, and all the people that marched yesterday in London, maybe two million of them, and all the others that were marching around other parts of the country and me in France, you know, we are trying to be the rainbow people that believe in peace. Um, and, and there's a promise here. The bow will be shattered. You can read, you know, the nuclear weapons will be dismantled. And the arrow split in half. And the chariot burnt in fire. In other words, we don't need all these weapons. We don't need the nuclear arms race. We don't need the cyber arms race that's now going on. As spies are all spying on each other and hacking each other's computers. We don't need that. As Edward Snowden revealed... What we need is true peace. And because, why? Because that's God. That's God's message to us. Be calm and know that I am your sustainer. In the King James Version, it's be still and know that I am God. And that's the motto of the University of Sussex, where my mother taught and where I've, you know, was brought up in the, in the awe of the University of Sussex. So I know that motto very well. I probably should have done my first degree there, but... Um, I went off to Bristol instead. And, but I love that motto of the University of Sussex. My daughter eventually studied there and graduated. My oldest daughter. So be still and know that I am God. That's my final message to you all, really. Be still and know that God is among us and with us. And that we're opposing Brexit because of the peace ethic. Because of that categorical imperative by Kant. Because it is our, you know, our duty... Cancer, there's no arguing with this. This is the categorical imperative. This is a duty we have to, to stand for peace and unity and that rainbow vision of society. So I'm going to finish with that. And uh, do read Psalm 46 and Surah 2 of the Quran. And, um, yeah, let's, let's give thanks that, that the day yesterday went so well and that gradually the voice of common sense is reasserting itself.